Can you hear me? Hey. <laughs> All right, great. Wow, I thought it would take 10 minutes for us to get this thing started. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's actually working. Okay, should we should we get started? <laughs> Have we not started? <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hey everybody, this is Big Anklevich, and uh, welcome to a, an episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm here with Rish Outfield. Hey, we, we can actually see each other. This is my first ever Zoom call. <laughs> That's right, Grandpa. You've finally made it into the modern age. <laughs> welcome to 2021. Uh, it's actually not worth being welcomed to, to tell you the truth. But there was a good thing that happened in 2021. We've got a guest with us today. We'll introduce him now. In 2021, he published his first novel. It is your first, right? It is my first. All right. So there he is. Jason Sanford is with us today. Why don't you introduce yourself to the folks at home? Uh, Jason Sanford, science fiction and fantasy author. Dune Steve fans may have heard a few podcasts of my stories. I think y'all have had quite a few on over the years. Two have been up for Nebula Awards, and I'm a finalist for the Hugo Award for, for a fan writer this year. But I think what your fans may remember me for are two uh, editions of Plague Birds that y'all podcast. That's right. Uh, and I, one of them... Y'all did such a great job. It was a finalist for the Parsec Award. <laughs> yeah. Jason's been a frequent guest, like he said, with his stories on our show. We've, we've shoot, I would say we've done like seven or eight, maybe even 10 of his stories over the years. I think so. And the Playbird ones, we uh, particularly like. Felt- oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rich. No, I've always felt he was the author who was most generous with us. Jason, we first met, well, met you through Starship Sofa back in 2009. Mm-hmm. You had a story called When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees. Mm. Yes. That I think published in Interzone in December of 2008. And it, it was May of wow. 2009. Your memory is amazing. <laughs> is when our reading of that went out. So it would have been right then after Interzone published your, your story that we got that. And as far as I know, they just randomly sent us that story. But do you remember hearing that? Do, do, do you listen to podcast versions of your stories? Yes, a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing as an author to hear uh, a podcast of your story. But I remember when y'all podcast and when Thorns were, are, are the Tips of Trees was uh, recorded. It, I believe that was my first podcast story ever. And it, it was indeed published in uh, Inner Zone. I was a newer writer then, and now I'm feeling old because you're you're naming dates and all that. Uh, but yeah, no, I definitely remember it. Now I got to be honest, though, some podcasts I'll listen to, but usually my it's like it's hard to because I'm hearing the words I wrote and I want to rewrite it, and I'm like, oh, don't listen, don't listen. No, that that makes total sense, <laughs> right? But we had never had something, and I, I no slight to the other authors that we've done on our show. But we had never had anything of that level of of quality or professionalism, I guess, because we were just starting out. We were nobodies. You know, it was just we couldn't even pay authors when we first started out. And uh, wow, we just put our all into that. We did sound effects. Do you remember big for the uh, <laughs> because if I recall, the, the, the plants communicated with noise mm-hmm. with and. And so, yeah, we just went all out. We wanted to make the best impression we could. And then I contacted you afterward and said, you know, did you like that? Do you have any stories that we could do on our show? And, and after that, the door was open. That, I always tell the story that you sent us three stories and said, you can pick one of these three or you can do all of them. <laughs> I remember. I remember. <laughs> That's right. And so, yeah, you were super generous. You didn't. Uh, give us any restrictions and you gave us those three stories and then once those three stories were out there <laughs> you sent us more and over the years it's just I've, I've always been impressed when when we first did that that story I asked my friend Jeff who's a big big sci-fi uh, reader hey, have you ever heard of Jason Sanford we're doing a story by him and he says yeah you you mean Brandon Sanderson don't you and <laughs> no no I didn't but 
Yes, I, you know, I got to be honest. That's the first time I've ever, ever, ever <laughs> been confused with Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> Not no, no slur on Brandon. I'm just like, hmm, I, I've never had that happen. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, here, here we are all these years later. And yes, we did two Plague Birds stories, but now you have a Plague Birds mm-hmm. novel. That is correct. Yes. And can you just tell us a little bit about the the story of that and how it's connected to what our listeners have heard on our show? Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, the first Plague Bird stories, and which was published in Inner Zone, it actually uh, was very popular. I, I won their uh, readers' poll for Story of the Year, and y- y- y'all also podcast the the first story. Yeah. I then published a second story in Inner Zone, maybe a year, maybe a little more after that. And that story was also a podcast. And that's the one y- y'all were finalists for the Parsec Awards for the, uh, and y'all went all out. I mean, I listened to that one because it just, it was amazing. I was like, this is like a full cast recording. And it, with the sound effects, it was just amazing. But when I wrote the original story, I really loved the world and I wanted to tell more. The second story did do that, but I, I, I felt the story wasn't complete. So what I ended up doing is I'm not a fan of authors who, Hey, I wrote a short story. Let me expand that short story to a novel. You know, if it worked as a short story, leave it as a short story. So the first few chapters of the novel, Plague Birds, are basically are an updated version of that original story. There is a new uh, short intro section before the where the story would be, but the, maybe the first three chapters, three or four chapters, are the original short story, but I've updated it. Um, I've rewritten it. Uh, there's new scenes and stuff like that just to make it work with uh, later developments in the story. That second story uh, you podcast is not in the novel at all. It is a standalone story. Apex Magazine actually just is reprinting it this month, uh, but it is a standalone story. So after those first three stories, uh, first three or four chapters of Plague Birds, the novel, it's all brand new stuff, telling, uh, continuing the story of Krista and Red Day. Krista is the main character. Red Day is the artificial intelligence. I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that it's a the story set in the far future with a lot of genetic manipulation has uh, kind of changed humanity. And uh, you've got artificial intelligences all over the place. And the plague birds are kind of the judges, executioners, and juries in the future world. They go around. There are humans that are bonded with artificial intelligence and uh, they enforce the laws of the world. So I, f- I wrote the whole novel, uh, realized I messed some things up, went back and did a complete rewrite. Apex Publications accepted it, and now it's out. Got some great, amazing art by Marcella Bolivar for the cover art, and uh, I'm happy with it. All right. Yeah, that is good art. The uh, d- Are you familiar with a, a writer named uh, Dave Wolverton or David Farland? He, he's a local writer here where, where Big and I used to live. And somebody, I'm not going to say it was me, somebody approached him and said, I only write short stories. Uh, I'm not really a novelist. And he said, well, you can't make a living only writing short stories. You have to find a way to be able to write novels. And I was just like, oh, no. But but you've had this career. And as far as I know, this is your first novel. That's correct. Do you agree with that? Why did you only do short stories up to this point? And how, what was the challenge of now writing a novel now that you're a grown man? <laughs> well, I was a grown man when I was writing the short stories too. But uh yeah, I, I do love short fiction. Um it's a it's a passion of mine, short stories. I love novel length fiction too. I'm not knocking novels or anything like that. Obviously, I wouldn't write a novel if I didn't think I, you know, that was the length I needed to write at to tell this story. But short fiction has a is a passion of mine because I think it's such a distilled, pure storytelling form. You know, with your novel length fiction, you can have some digressions. You can go off on some tangents. You can explore all, you know, different characters in the story. With a short story, you don't have a lot of words. You've got to really keep it focused and you got to make the voice and the characters really pop. And it, it can be, uh, it's, I think it's difficult to, to pull off a great short story. And uh, I, I do love it. You know, it's just like, you know, you sit down with a two, three thousand or five to six thousand word short story and you know, you can spend, you know, 30 minutes reading it and that story can change your life. And I love that. I love it. So I, I mainly have written short fiction. Um, I've been pretty successful for it. I don't want to put out and 
make any, anyone believe I make a living from my short fiction. I have a job. I work, you know, to support me and my family, you know, and, but short fiction is a passion of mine. I, I'm going to keep writing short stories. I actually have a, uh, one of my short stories is a cover story for the current issue of Asimov Science Fiction. I've had a, what, eight or nine stories in Asimov's over the years, but this is my first cover story. Um, I'm going to keep working on and publishing the short fiction. The Anyone who's uh, watching this, uh, if you're watching this with the video, the il Im illustration behind me is an illustration for one of my stories. And as I was telling y'all earlier, the cat does not get run over. The cat is one of the heroes of the story. <laughs> it's the story called Whistle Post of Forgotten Railroads. And it's a pretty emotional story about life and death and loss and all that. And I think it's only 3,000 words. And honestly, I don't think I could, if I had written that story as a novel, it would not work. So I love short fiction. But then with Plague Birds, there's things I could not do with short fiction. When I wanted to keep diving into the world of Plague Birds, I thought about making a whole sequence of short stories. But I realized that, you know what, I, I've got some larger ambitions I want to do. And there's some things you can do with novels you can't do with short fiction. And so in this case, I was like, you know what, it's going to be a, a novel. But you remember I said I rewrote it? Uh -huh. well, that's because I was I, I made some screw ups at, at the novel length writing that I, you know, I was trying to do some stuff with short fiction in the novel length. It didn't work. I had to go back and redo it. But it worked out. By the way, did I ever say I ramble? I can ramble <laughs> as much as you need me to. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you've written a novel, is this indicative of a changeover for you? Are you thinking of becoming a novelist? Is this something that's going to be more frequent? Or are you still, you know, short stories uh, mostly? And maybe if you come up with some idea that has to be... I think it depends on the idea and what I want to write. Um, I've got some ideas I'm working on that will definitely be short fiction, but I've also got a couple of uh, big things I want to work on and they, they're going to definitely be novels. I'm kind of cheating on my current next book. It is a novel written as four separate short stories. Ah. Uh, three of them have already been published. One actually was a finalist for the Nebula Award. Um, Blood Grain Speak Through Memories. They've all been published in Beneath uh, Ceaseless Skies. So three stories in a sequence, each telling the larger story, standalone stories, but they tell the larger story through different the viewpoints of, of three different characters. So I'm finishing the fourth and final story, which will com basically comprise a uh, entire novel, but made of four separate standalone stories. So that doesn't really count because I think that's still kind of short story-ish, but you could call it a novel if you want, but I am working on some ideas for some actual uh, full-length novels, including I've started sketching out a sequel to Plague Birds. All right. Yeah, that's that's uh, something that I was wondering about. I, uh, Rish here wrote his first uh, novel length. Well, I don't know. Depends on what you call novel length. For a long time, we've considered, you know, we think about the Hugo category where they say anything 40,000 words or up counts as a novel. And I think you've written some things that are more than 40,000 words, right, Rish? But just recently you wrote something as what? How long was it? Like 77? 62. 62? So, yeah, it's his first kind of novel, you know, what you would consider a novel length novel, not a, a real thin novel, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's hard to, if I mean, if you're trying to sell to a professional publisher, it's difficult to sell a novel that's 45,000 words. Right. I will say with self-publishing and Kindle and Amazon's Kindle system and all that, I think those parameters are changing. But uh, yeah, you know, traditionally you're talking 70, 75,000 at a minimum for what most publishers would want to publish as a novel. But that said, it's again, changing quickly. That's uh, something that I've heard a lot of, you know, been, been to a few different writers conferences and things like that. And there's people that work full time as self-published authors. And, you know, they were they would talk about putting out a novel like a, every month, you know. <laughs> I have views on that, but I'll keep them. I'll yeah. <laughs> and basically, they were just like, you know, we can't turn off the spigot. Your fans will go away. So. You know, they would just churn stuff out and they would have, you know, a four, it was short. Obviously, it'd be like a 40,000 uh, word novel, not a huge, you know, not, yeah. not one of those, uh, you know, fantasy tomes, the ones that are like this big. Not a Brandon Sanderson. Right, exactly. Not like the Way of Kings where, you know. By the way, can I just add a note 
you know, Brandon Sanderson is like a really nice guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen him a few times. It's amazing how he interacts with his fans. And uh, just want to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so another reason why we would confuse you with him. There you go. Oh. <laughs> The second story that we did of, of Plague Birds, I think, was called The Ever Dreaming. The Ever, what, what is it, Vic? Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plagues, oh, I think. Of is plagues. Yeah. Holy cow. But that's the one that's not incorporated into your novel, Jason. Do, is the, that is does correct. that still take place somewhere in the future? And do you have to keep that in the back of your mind that I don't want to contradict that? Sometime we're going to get to that. No, it's, it's a standalone story. And it's, it's in the canon. It's in the Plague Birds canon for sure, because uh, it takes place about a third of the way through the novel. It's just not included in the novel. But I got one sentence in there that referenced it. You know, just I was like anybody reads a story, they read this. Oh, OK. Yeah. So it is there. It's just not shown as part of the novel. It's kind of it's a standalone story. I'd like to I was haven't mentioned this to my publisher yet, but I was hoping to they published it in Apex magazine this month, uh, reprinted it. And I was hoping that, you know, hey, maybe y'all should publish it as a standalone book if Plague Birds does well, like I said. But it, it is definitely part of the story. And uh, honestly, when I was initially writing the story, I thought I would include, I mean, the novel, I thought I would include it. But I realized it was just a standalone. It was like a sh in this, what, a, I think right under 10,000 words. So it is a longer story. Yeah. But it's gonna, it'll just function as a standalone story of the two main characters. But I think it holds up well. If I remember right, we had to make it two episodes because it was long enough. <laughs> it was a long one, but I, I do love it. I, I kind of went through to see if I needed to clean it up, and I think it still holds up. I'm pleased with it. My my publisher and editor liked it, so he wouldn't have reprinted it. So <laughs> Right. Yeah, if nothing else, you know, 10 years from now, when you, when you do the anniversary edition, you could include it in the back or something like that. <laughs> I'd love it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I loved uh, I loved the podcast y'all have done over the years for my stories. I mean, uh, it, like I said, sometimes it's hard for me to listen to podcasts usually of my works just because, uh, like I said, it kind of resonates since I wrote the words. It's hard to hear the words being read to me or narrated. And, and it. but your podcast, especially those, I mean, it's just like it was like sitting down in front of a you know TV show, but all all audio and just listening, you know, and I. Which is still disturbing, you know, because you, you know, I'm like, wow, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I've loved what y'all done, and and I'm glad your podcast magazine's done so well. Yeah, well, thanks. We've loved to have you. I will have to admit, it's it's been a pleasure for in in each case, each time that uh, your name comes up again. I think a you're one of the fans' favorites. You know, they look forward to your stories when they would come up. And you were one of our favorites. We looked forward to doing your stories when they would come up because, you know, that's the one thing that you um, always did is your worlds are so generally very different than the real world. You know what I mean? Like a lot of stories are just set in the real world, in the real world with a slight change or something like that. Or there's a, a future that's easy to imagine, if you know what I mean. Yours tend to uh, be m so much more different that it's, you know, like when I say easy to imagine, yours are a little, I guess, a little harder to imagine. I assume they must take so much more work on your part, you know, so much more pre-planning to come up with all the background uh, stuff that uh, you, you put into the worlds because, you know, it's not really a recognizable thing for us. So, you know, it's such a, it's such a really interesting and fun narration and pr production to do uh, oh, cool. to make that stuff work and some of the things that we have to come up with you know how do you do something like this in audio so that it portrays what's happening can be <laughs> a challenge i remember some of the audio effects you've done there was one where you made i, I forgot how you did the voice or something but it was just like wow <laughs> you know and it was like Y'all took so far beyond what I wrote. I loved it. I, and I can't remember which story it is now, uh -huh. but it just it like sent chills up my spine. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, it has been a while, sadly. It's a little bit like translating something into another language where we have to interpret the meaning. And it might not be exactly the way you intended it. Is there an audio version of your novel, Plague Birds? Uh, no, no, there is not. No, but it's possible they 
you know, we may release one, but it hasn't. There is an option for the publisher to do one, but it, at this point, there's not. But in professional circles, you wouldn't have anything to do with that, right? They would go off and pick a narrator and and produce it outside of yours. And so even if you're to say, oh, no, that's not the way that I saw it in my head, you have no control over that. Am I right? Uh, actually, I, I do. I do have some control, mainly, mainly because I went with a small press for uh, Plague Birds. Um, I don't think I would have as much control if I went with the larger press publisher had published it. Um, but, you know, with Apex Books, they're not going to, hey, we're going to do this. Congratulations. We're going to run you over now. Um, if I had issues, uh, they would definitely do, deal with it. In fact, side note, the illustration for my story here, uh, Whistle Post of uh, Forgotten Railroads, came out a year ago in Fireside Quarterly. I don't know if y'all heard what happened. This was actually, this is the last print edition of Fireside Magazine. They're still publishing. They're online. So what happened is last year, um, Maurice Broadus edited, guest edited this ish, issue. He picked my story and a bunch of others. Uh, he picked an essay. I say, where is it here? By Regina Bradley. And I'll read you the, the first sentence and tell you what happened. So the essay is a personal essay written by Regina Bradley that starts off that says, I am a Southern Black woman who stands in the long shadow of the civil rights movement. She is speaking from her personal experience. And so the magazine releases audio versions of all the stories that they publish. So they released an audio version of that essay narrated by a white man who decided to do a fake black Southern accents mixed with a Jamaican accent. It was horrid. <laughs> it got me national media attention. And basically even the publisher admitted, admitted it was basically audio blackface. I mean, the author, Regina Bradley, was outraged, and rightly so. They had not consulted with Dr. Bradley or with Maurice Broadus about that. The publisher just said, hey, you go do this, narrate it. And then, yeah, so you don't you don't want something like that to happen. You know what I mean? Right. It unfortunately caused a good bit of fallout on that, and uh, the magazine's still around, and they've made some changes. I guess that's to say how, how it all came out. So, yes, I... All that means is, yes, I would want to have some input in who is narrating my stories. And I think most authors would because you don't want, you know, it's part of your vision. I'm usually pretty laid back on stuff. Y'all done a great job, so I've got no issues. But, you know, for something like a novel, you know, I just at least want to know who's narrating it. I always knew y'all were narrating it, and I'm cool with that. But you wouldn't want your publisher just out of nowhere saying, we're doing this, and you don't know what we're doing until. Anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's definitely something. I mean, it's your your book. It's your career. You know, you don't want to wind up being the focus of media attention for something like that. <laughs> Instead, you want the media attention because, wow, this is a great book kind of media attention. Yeah. So, yeah, it's important to, to guard that kind of stuff for sure. It's hard to narrate, though, y'all. You know, a narration is a fine art and creating a audio version of a story is a fine art. So if Apex said we are going to go ahead with the audio, do you want to narrate it? Would you decline? Oh, I, I would decline and so fast you would, I mean, you it'd be like a lightning bolt. I would decline so fast. Um, I've narrated two of my stories before. I think one was from Starship Sofa. The second one, I, I don't remember where it was. After I did the first one, I said, I'm never doing that again. Then I got talked into it. I did again. I said, <laughs> Why did I do that again? I'm not a narrator. I don't like to narrate, and it's hard to, for me to do it. And I also narrate someone else's story for Starship Sofa, or for their, uh, I'm sorry, for their horror pod podcast. And I said, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> anyway, but I narrated the story. I agreed to do it. And I remember Tony said, Jason, you have a Southern accent. You would be wonderful. Because, <laughs> you know, the character was supposed to be Southern and all that. I said, fine, I'll do it. I was young and naive. Then I read the story and I realized, oh, crap, this story has I have to sing in parts of it. <laughs> and that was like a special hell. <laughs> so, no, never again. I'm never narrating again. I'm a writer. I don't narrate. I can ramble on a podcast or an interview, but I'm not I'm not going to narrate. All right. So your book came out a couple of weeks ago now, right? It's I think two weeks. Yes. Yeah. And uh, how is how has that been? What has the experience been like? It's been stressful, mainly because I, it's a busy time in my life right now, uh, outside the book. I haven't written anything in two weeks because I've been so busy with all the 
you know, stuff doing to promote the book, but also uh, just general life stuff. Everything is like, you know, I always thought I'd be able to enjoy my the release of my book and and life said, you know, we're going to put everything a whole year's worth of crap in three weeks and dump it on you. Enjoy. But it's been thrilling to see the book come out, though. That's a special. I've always wanted to publish and write a novel. Um, it's my first one. And then have Apex do such an amazing job. The cover art alone. I just want to move to tears and cry over how great it came out. Well, hey, Jason, tell us how that happens. Do you have any control over the cover art? Actually, yes. I Apex, uh, Jason Sizemore. Do you know Jason? He's the publisher and editor of uh, Apex. He also edits and publishes the magazine, Apex Magazine. You know, obviously, as publisher, they hire and, and work with the artist. So hey, Jason contacted me and said, hey, you familiar with Marcella uh, Bolivar, uh, the artist? And I was like, oh, I love her art. And he's like, well, we'd like her to do the art. And I was like, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. So then uh, we kind of went back and forth. Marcella wants some, you know, she needs to know what kind of stuff are we looking for? Give me some ideas. Even though there's description of uh, on the cover, I'll, I'll hold it up for anybody who's watching. This is Krista, the main character on the cover. And it is cut uh, from a scene in the novel, although it's it, a lot of artistic license, which I absolutely wanted Marcella to take. But she wanted um, information on what the character looks like, all that kind of stuff. Jason Sizemore and I and, and others uh, at Apex bounced around different scenes, maybe some ideas. And we kind of just threw all that together and sent it to Marcella. She worked up, based on our, our feedback and everything, three draft illustrations. And I got to be honest, all three of them were amazing. And, and when I'm saying draft illustrations, it's not like it used to be where, you know, you may have gotten a charcoal sketch. You know, we're talking a an illustration created, you know, because a lot of the, the artists created digitally. Right. An illustration that, you know, you could use as a finished illustration for a book. You know, it was like, wow. And uh, basically, Jason and other staff, everybody was like, okay, which one do we like best? This one was the one I was like, this one, this one, you know, sent a few feedbacks to Marcella. And so to other staff, we tweaked and went with this one. And it turns out, I told you we'd sent Marcella some ideas for what the art could be. She had created those, but this one that she created was kind of her inspiration. And it was her favorite, but she didn't tell us. She didn't want to bias it. But we were all like, we want this one. And she was like, oh, great. That's the one I kind of decided to do something risky and went out on a limb with. And it's my favorite. And we were like, we'd love it. So, yes, that was my rambling way of saying, yes, I got to be very involved. (laughs) Again, that's something uh, that I know a large publisher would not let me be in that involved in. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Well, for example, your Asimov's cover, you don't have any say in that, I would assume. No, I, I, I mean, Sheila Williams is the editor of Asimov's, and um, I did not know she had picked my story for an illustration until um, the illustration was done. She sent it to me to look at, and I was like, oh, this is wow, I love it. And I do, I, do, I love it too, but I mean, I didn't see it until it was done. Fortunately, it, it came <laughs> out amazing because she picked a great artist. But I don't know the process that Asimov's has. Uh, and a magazine also has a different time scale. Right. And uh, they're bi-monthly. So they're having to release an issue every two months or six times a year. So they've got some different uh, time pressures than a small press like Apex, which is working towards a book that is going to be on the shelves for a long time. But it, they're not releasing it every month or two. Right. I See, I'm I'm at a much lower level of of success than you are, Jason. So the things that you're going through are fascinating to me. From inception of Plague Birds, the novel, to publishing, which was end of September, how long a stretch of time was this? Let's see. You seem to have a better memory than me. I think the original Plague Bird story came out in 2010. I could be wrong, but I want to say sometime in 2010 in, in Interzone. The second story came out a year or two after that, somewhere in there. I'm not, uh, again, off the top of my head, I'm not remembering the exact dates. I didn't start working on the novel until maybe 2014. Again, I'm not writing this novel uh, by itself. I'm work also working on a number of short stories at the same time. I'm publishing a good bit of short fiction. So I worked on the novel for a year or so, a year and a half or so, finished it up. Again, that's when I discovered, you know what, congratulations, Jason, you've got a major rewrite ahead of you and not just a cleanup rewrite. I had to, you know, make major plot changes and some other stuff because, again, it was my first novel. 
I screwed the pooch on some stuff. But the thing was, I was deeply invested in the story and I want, I knew how to make it work. I just knew it was going to take a lot more time. I did put it aside for a bit because it is dejecting when you realize you have to do that major of a rewrite. <laughs> I did the rewrite, um, got it cleaned up. I did send it out to some publishers and editors and agents. Plague Birds, as y'all know, is kind of, even though it's science fiction, it, it reads somewhat like a, a dark fantasy, okay? So there's some blurring of the genres. It is science fiction, but it it reads like the fantasy. So I got uh, some agents who were like, man, this is so, we love this, so weird, but I don't know how to market it, so we have to pass, which was frustrating as hell. So after that reaction, I said, you know what, I'm going to, I did a final third rewrite just to clean up some, not as in-depth, it was just kind of a, you know, if I'm going to go through it again, that was in 2019, early 2020. I submitted it to uh, Apex March, April 2020, somewhere in there, right before the pandemic kind of went bluey. And they accepted it in December 2020. Worked, you know, we have copy edits and all that working on the artwork. And then it came out in September of this year. So it was accepted last December, essentially. And then ever since then, it's been in production. So a fairly long process. It was. And I mean, part of it, now i got to be honest, my writing style is not everyone else's. I write tend to write rather slowly, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I know authors who can crank out a novel a month. <laughs> I have views on that, like I said earlier. I think that kind of burns you out, and eventually it's going to make your brain explode or turn to mush, and you're going to have to take a big, long break from your fiction <laughs> writing because you just can't keep that up. But I understand why they do it because, you know, hey, like they said, you know, you can crank that many books out. You, you know, keep your fans happy and they're coming back for you. I don't write like that. I'm a lot slower, but it's, it's, it works for me. So, no, nope, I'm not going to complain. Uh, let me go back to something Big said a minute ago where he was talking about the worlds that you, you create. You put in a ton of thought, if not effort, into what this future will be like. And then are you ever tempted to just yeah. stay in that future, in that world and say, oh, I could write three or four more stories set in this one. So I don't have to come up with a new locale. I am tempted and I, I am going to write more stories. Uh, part of it, though, is I have more stories I want to tell. I mean, I, uh, I love the characters of Krista and Red Day. I'm trying not to give spoilers, but I love their relationship between the two of them is very unique. And you can touch on all the emotions. When they're by themselves, if you know what I mean. You know, usually if you got one character by themselves in the story, ooh, you can't really get that repartee going back and forth. We can with Krista and Red Day. No spoilers, but read it if you want to find out what I'm talking about. They're stuck together, and I love it. But also, uh, there's things I explore in the, the novel that are of great interest to me. I mean, I'm talking about issues. I mean, in my fiction, I mean, I'm talking about stuff I see in the world around me. I, I kind of have a weird outlook on life. So I see the world in a unique way. And I kind of, and that goes right into my fiction. And this is, I mean, the novel, yes, it's set in the far future, but I mean, it's also about the world today in many ways. And I definitely got more I want to say. And while the I, the novel is a standalone novel, I, 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 I that's another one of my pet peeves is when you read a book and, oh crap, cliffhanger. This is the first book in the series. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna have to wait five years for book two. <laughs> yeah, when you're reading a book by George R. R. Martin, and you're like, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> so the book does have a good. I mean, it is a self-contained story. It wraps up, but I did leave some things for a second book. So um, there are bigger issues I want to, uh, which I do want to explore. And so far, I haven't heard from anyone saying I didn't tie things up. I mean, a few reviewers are like, "Hey, this is great," and he also left a few things. He wrapped things up, but I could see he could write us more books. And I, I do intend to. And I, I don't know how many I'm going to write. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm, I definitely have a, a, the idea of the story for the second book. And I will go from there. You know what I mean? I don't want to overpromise. <laughs> right. See if uh, something else pops up as you're doing the, uh, the next book. And maybe there'll be a third and so forth. But I do love this world. But I got to be honest, most of my stories are standalone. And, I, and when I'm done with it, it's like it's cleared from my mind and I don't ever think about the story again. And I got to be honest, this is kind of embarrassing. I, I never admitted this, but once I a story is cleared from my mind, 
I sometimes have trouble even remembering what the title is, just how my mind works. <laughs> well, it probably has a lot to do with the kind of titles that you come up with. It's your own <laughs> fault, Jason. <laughs> Make a shorter title. <laughs> so I was at a convention once and uh, a publisher came up to me and he was working on a big anthology. And he's like, man, I love this story of yours. I'm, I may include it. And he ended up including it. And I was thrilled. But he's talking to me like, I just love this story. What was the title? And I was like going, Oh shit. <laughs> oh shit. Um, I was like, as so I'm, I take a big swig of my drinks. Oh, I think I've been drinking. Hold on. And then luckily one of my friends came up, talked to him, say, I turned around, pulled it up my phone. Pat, 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 pat. Oh, that's it. Okay. Oh, you mean this story? <laughs> I had totally, totally forgotten this title of my own story, even though I knew what story he was talking about. But like I said, it was, it's not, it's just when I cl- finish a story and I feel it's totally wrapped up, I purge it. You know right. what I mean? It is purged. Right. But the good news is Plague Birds has not been purged because I, I there's a lot more I want to tell in that world, more stories I want to tell. So it feels different with this one. That's why I know I'm going to write more. Yeah, it could be worse. Rish has a tendency to be looking through his computer and find a file and be like, what is this? And he'll open it up and it'll be a story that he wrote and he doesn't remember even writing it. Doesn't seem familiar to him at all. So... At least you know that you wrote the story. You just can't remember the title. It's not a bad thing. I mean, I, I got to be honest, Rich, I've been there too. I've, I've found, oh, I forgot I wrote that. Um, but when you do that, that's actually part of my writing style. When I come back to it, I put stories aside. So when I was saying, you know, I, I started writing Plague Birds in 2014. Yeah, I wrote it and then I put it aside, come back to it, because that lets me come back to it with clean eyes, you know, from a fresh perspective. So when I find a story I worked on a long time ago, I usually didn't finish it because there was an issue I couldn't overcome at that time. I am what they call a discovery writer, or if you want to call me a pantser, I, I'm, I don't use that term, but discovery writer for my short fiction. So I don't plot my short fiction out. And I'll come back to a story after six months or even a year away. And uh, I'll be like, oh, I know how to make this work now as I'm going through it. And it works out. There, so there's great if you can come back to a story and you've forgotten about it, I think that really helps you improve it. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, where can people get Plague Birds, the novel? Uh, it's, uh, uh, is there a place that you prefer that they get it? They can order directly from Apex Books. Obviously, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org, I believe it is. You know, uh, uh, All the places. You can order from almost any bookstore. It is a small press, so I don't know how many, I can't tell you if it's in your local bookstore or not, but all the all the big players. And if you want to order directly from Apex, that's always a good thing. I will point out right now is a rough time for small presses because paper prices have increased dramatically. I think you know, small press is facing a 10 or 11 percent increase for publishing books just on the paper price alone. And then there's an increased cost of shipping everything right now. Uh, mailing costs are gone up. But that said, those issues are also hitting your local bookstores. So order it from your local bookstore. You know, I've, I have no problem with that. Or, you know, order it from uh, Apex, order it from. And honestly, if you want to order it from Kindle, uh, Amazon, you want it on your Kindle, you go for it. Because you know what? I'd rather you read it than not. <laughs> you know, so in Amazon, I mean, they're a fact of life. You got to deal with it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I was pretty excited. I have to admit, uh, when your Facebook post came up talking about uh, plague birds coming out. And as soon as I saw it, I thought I got to get, you know, I got to forward this along to anybody that I know that might be uh, willing to pick this up. I don't know how many sales we may have gotten for you. I know at least I got my copy. So, (laughs) Well, thank you very much. And I pre-ordered it. So if you can tell, it's got the... Oh, it's got that nice designed book cover. With the sign. Let me see. Put it over the mic so you can see. That's great. That's great. great. So I couldn't resist. And uh, Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Hopefully, uh, several other people, you know, got theirs by way of that as well. But if not, hopefully after seeing this... They'll be interested again. Hopefully they remember the stories that we've done in the past from yours and will, will you know, remember just how good they can be. And, and I think if people liked your podcast of the of both stories, they're going to love the novel because, like I said, it it goes into some strange, strange places. I'll be honest. It's, it, can, it gets weird, but 
you know, I had a, I had a lot of fun writing the stories out, you know, the story out, because like I said, I do love the characters of Red Day and Krista and uh, it's exciting to be able to take them on a, a much more longer journey. Yep. And I'm excited. I haven't gotten around to reading it yet. Unfortunately, you know, I'm slow at that. I have to admit, I don't know if you can tell, but I got a lot of books back there. <laughs> well, thanks for wondering. I appreciate that. I mean, I should mention when the cover came out, thought I, I thought I'd tell y'all I saw this uh, big U- YouTuber who's a, a fantasy uh, he, a booktuber talking about the cover and everything. And and in the comments, someone said, I got so excited when I you mentioned this on this YouTube because I, I remember the original stories from from Doonstein. Oh, wow. I was like, wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that always surprises me when I when I hear tell of uh, our show from some somebody once said that like they were on vacation. I want to say it was at the Eiffel Tower, somewhere like that, and they saw somebody wearing a Dune Steve shirt. And cool. he said, Oh, Dune Steve, give him the thumbs up. The guy gave him, and I just thought that can't, you know, that the odds of two Dune Steve fans coming within contact of each other is longer than winning the lottery. That can't be possible. I think y'all have a lot more fans than you realize. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll we'll give you the rest of your Sunday afternoon. And we'll let you go. It's been a great to talk with you and, and uh, hear the stories. And, you know, we wish you the best of luck with uh, Plague Birds and with the further novels and short stories down the road. Can't wait to see your name come up again in my uh, Facebook feed telling me that there's another thing that I can uh, I can pre-order. Great. I appreciate the support. And like I said, thank you. I uh, Honestly, I think this novel without uh, Dune Steef would not be where it is today. And I, I'm certain of that. So thank you. Wow. Well, thanks. That's that's great to hear. That That really makes me feel good, I have to admit. And nothing you want to say anything? Okay, go ahead, Rich. Sorry. <laughs> I said, and nothing in Big's life makes him feel good. So <laughs> you're breathing <laughs> rarefied air, Jason. Oh. <laughs> oh well, hey, y'all, I'm like I said, anytime. Y'all I appreciate all y'all have done and keep doing it. Keep just keep going, you know. Hope to meet y'all in person one day when this world settles down, so to speak. Right, right. All right. Well, thanks a lot for being here with us. And I guess we'll see you around. Take care. Thanks, everybody, watching and listening, too. We'll see you uh, next time. Sorry for picking my nose. It just, it, I forgot you were there. <laughs>The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. All right. Oh, no, 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 that's well, I'll, I'll let you go. I'll, I'll oh, talk to you 30 later. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, okay, go. It was stiflingly hot in the car. You were, you were right even though it's only 62 degrees. All right, have a good afternoon. I'll talk to you later today, okay? All right, talk to you later. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.